our next guest has had a quiet influence on all of our lives. As publisher of Saturday Night, Western Living, Vancouver Magazine, her leadership at Hootsuite, Edelman, she has been at the receiving end and the giving end of change. How can institutions of all kinds, by their very nature built to resist change, come to understand it and embrace it? Please welcome Kim Peacock. One day when I was eight years old, my dad came home and told us we were moving to New Brunswick. His company had transferred us to Calgary from Edmonton only two years before. At the kitchen table, he spread maps, pictures, brochures of what our new adventure would look like. The Albertan landscape, dominated by the mountains we skied and camped in, would be supplanted by weekends at the beach. We would see whales and tall ships in the Halifax Harbor. He pointed out the route of my short walk to school, and our new house was much bigger, with a massive unfenced yard and an undeveloped forest behind it. In the fantasy world in my mind, the Huck Finn-like summers I spent exploring Fish Creek would be exchanged for a Disney-like experience of cavorting through the trees, making friends with woodland creatures. My best friend Michelle lived a few doors down, and I ran to tell her the exciting news and found her in her yard. As soon as I told her, she burst out, why would you move there? It's ugly and polluted. She stomped into the house. I was stunned. We'd never had a fight, and suddenly she was mad at me. Was it ugly? I didn't know it was polluted, but she was a year older than me, so she must know what she's talking about. I was sure she would never speak to me again. It was my first experience with two lessons on change that have held. One, there are many perspectives and reactions to change besides your own. And two, to embrace change inevitably requires letting something else go. Fast forward many years to retreat, a retreat with Robert Gass at Hollyhock on Cortez Island. A doctorate in organizational and clinical psychology from Harvard University, Robert has worked with Fortune 500 companies, Greenpeace, and for the past seven years, leaders in the Obama administration. His theory is to effectively lead and inspire change, you must first acknowledge the bias of your own perspective. Robert asked us to make a list of things said by bosses, colleagues, our partners that really annoyed us. He asked us to pick one trigger phase, and then I was asked to do the demonstration. My trigger phase was something a colleague had repeatedly said to me in front of my boss and my direct reports that I felt undermined my credibility. Robert had me close my eyes and took me through a guided meditation where he'd hit me with the trigger phase, snap his fingers, and asked the first thing that came into my head. The first thing I said, by the way, was, fuck you. <laughs> Heartfelt, but not particularly productive. He did this repeatedly, each time building on the last reaction. When we got to the basement, it was the place of fear of rejection and loss of love. With my eyes still closed, he asked me to remember the moment in my life where I first felt that. I was seven years old, playing in our front yard. My dad was standing at the front door, really angry with me about something. He turned abruptly, went into the house, and closed the door. It was the first time I remember him being angry with me, and I was struck by how alone I felt. Robert asked me to go back to that seven-year-old and simply tell her, I see you. The purpose of this trigger mapping was twofold. First, to understand that our reactions are our perceptions only, and are influenced by the experiences that have shaped us. And second, I wasn't unique. Robert had us return to our course materials, and there laid out was the exact progression I had gone through. It was humbling and liberating to see how commonly shared the fears that block us are. It taught that until we find compassion for ourselves, it's impossible to find it with others. Ego is described as a person's sense of self-esteem or self-importance. As humans who need to be accepted and loved, the measure is often tied to what others think and say. While the ego can serve a useful purpose driving us forward in personal achievement, it also encourages us to believe we are separate from everyone else. The ego is deeply unhelpful in navigating change and crisis in a world full of others who will either help or hinder that process. What is helpful is defining your values in a way that acknowledges that which is connected to everyone and everything else. This explains a lot when we see people in leadership positions fail in navigating change and crisis situations. The very thing, ego, 
that drive success is also its biggest Achilles heel. This does not bode well for Donald Trump, <laughs> who uses his Twitter feed as an ongoing tour of his ego. It's also a look at his personal trigger map. We are born into a fraught relationship with time and change. The ancient Greeks had two words to refer to time, chronos, referring to sequential time, and kairos, a moment of indeterminate length in which conditions are right for crucial action or decision making. I've always seen the mountains as manifestations of this concept of time and change. Formation occurs when tectonic plates collide and the earth rises slowly over millions of years, or quickly when a volcano erupts along the fault line, forming a mountain in as little as a few weeks. I named my firm K2 as a reminder. The mountain's ancientness and perceived permanence belies the fact that it's pure chronos and its change is unstoppable, though it's measured over millions of years. That slow, quiet manifestation of change is boss, and if you forget it, it will kick your ass. One person dies on that mountain for every four that summit. I've spent the past 20 odd years leading and counseling leaders in change and crisis. I've worked in media and tech, transportation and energy, real estate and retail, healthcare and nonprofits. I've dealt with fault form mountains of chronos change, evolutions in growth and strategic focus, disruption of industries, and the volcanic Kairos, CEOs and public figures caught in crossfire and scandal, natural disasters, and human error that leads to crisis. Both situations have equal opportunity to either build social goodwill and trust or destroy it. This is a challenging time to be a leader. Trust in traditional institutions has collapsed as the dominance of social media has risen. A, pres a president of a prominent energy company once said to me, Kim, pipelines used to be such a boring business. <laughs> Many believe we are heading to our own destruction, but I have faith we are being pushed somewhere better. With the US inauguration two days away, it seems hard to believe. But transformative evolution is always messy and rarely follows a straight line. A year ago, the Rennie Collection held a show loosely titled Chaos, themed around justice and social change. This piece here by Zimbabwean artist Dan Holder struck me. The words say, when the bag tears, the shoulders get a rest. I asked Bob what this piece meant to him, and he said, when shit happens, you get to do an audit. <laughs> you lose all your money, you decide what your priorities are, you figure out how to get through. Someone has cancer, you figure out how to spend time with the people you love. You reevaluate the road you're taking. It lets you step up. Having the courage to do that is key. When what we have faith in collapses, we have an opportunity to take stock and do better, be better. Change happens, sometimes violently, and tests our resilience and our ability to evolve. We're all change navigators because we have no choice. The Hindu scholar Eknath Aswaran said it has taken four or five billion years to acquire a name and a social security number. Billions of years of evolution from primordial matter to matter that is very personal indeed. And lifetimes of experiment, experimentation as human beings, the trial and tribulation that have gone into the making of this human body create necessary context for improving our existence. We didn't get to choose to be here, and we don't get to choose the circumstances of change, because even those we instigate throw off ripples we didn't anticipate. I go back to the lessons of the mountains in my eight-year-old self. While the hobbit in me is always quite ready for another adventure, I am still learning to understand other perspectives and to let go of what I can no longer be attached to. I am still learning true compassion that understands what is in me is connected to everybody and everything else. But I believe this learning is not what makes us weak, but what makes us strong. Indeed, it's the only way to build strength. Thank you, Sam and Lynn, and thank you. <laughs>